Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Da Science, and today I want to introduce the harmonic oscillator in another one of her videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. If you have studied classical physics, you will know that the harmonic oscillator is one of the most important systems in the whole of physics. The harmonic oscillator allows us to study problems ranging from the vibration of strings all the way to the behaviour of electronic circuits. You won't be surprised to hear that the harmonic oscillator plays a similarly central role in quantum mechanics. In the quantum world, it allows us to study properties ranging from the motion of atoms in solids to the the behavior of light. But there is another very important reason why the quantum harmonic oscillator is key. It is one of only a handful of problems that we know how to solve exactly. So it is very commonly used to exemplify really important concepts in quantum mechanics. And as you can imagine, this is something that is extremely valuable when you're starting to learn quantum theory. So let's go! The harmonic oscillator is a key system both in classical and quantum mechanics. And its defining feature is that it is a system with a potential energy that depends quadratically on the amplitude. Let's draw a pair of axes. We place the x coordinate on the horizontal axis and the potential energy v of x on the vertical axis. The potential energy of a one dimensional harmonic oscillator is then proportional to x squared, and we conventionally define the proportionality constant as one half times k, where k is a positive constant. We can now draw this harmonic potential right here. In classical mechanics, we know that the force experienced by a particle is given by the negative of the gradient of the potential in which it moves. In the case of the harmonic potential, we get this derivative, which is equal to minus kx. From this, we can very clearly see how a classical particle moves in a harmonic potential. If x is larger than zero in this region, then the force is negative, so it pushes the particle toward the origin. If x is smaller than zero, then the force is positive, again pushing the particle towards the origin. Overall, we get a particle oscillating back and forth about the origin. I will not solve the classical problem here, but my guess is that most of you will have encountered it before. If you haven't, you can check pretty much any book on classical mechanics to find the solution. From the solution of the classical harmonic oscillator, we know that the motion of a particle of mass m is a harmonic motion of frequency omega, where omega is equal to the square root of k over m. With this omega, we can rewrite the potential up here like this which is a very commonly used form. Perhaps the most famous classical system undergoing harmonic motion is that of a mass attached to a string. And in that context, this expression here for the force is called Hooke's law. However, there are actually many different situations which can be described using harmonic potentials, and what I want to do next is to discuss why that is the case. Let's start by drawing our pair of axes again. We now consider a general arbitrary potential, which I'm just making up as I am drawing it. This particular potential has three local minima, one here which we label x0, one here which we label x1, and one here which we label x2. Let's now zoom in into the region of the potential near x0, and redraw this region. We know that classically, if a particle is placed at a local minimum here, it will stay there in a state of static equilibrium because the force vanishes at the minimum. If we now displace a particle away from the minimum, but insist that this displacement is small, we can approximate the general potential V about the minimum x0 using a Taylor expansion. It is given by the value of the potential at the minimum, then we have the first order term, the second order term, the third order term, and so on. As we're expanding about the minimum at x0, then by definition of a minimum, this first order derivative vanishes, so the linear term is 0. For small enough displacements, then the dominant term in the expansion will be the lowest order term, which is the quadratic term here. 
What we can therefore do to describe the motion per particle near the minimum is to discard all higher order terms and only retain the quadratic term. This is of course an approximation and we should always check its validity. Graphically, we can add a quadratic to our general potential and we see that it agrees with the real potential near the minimum, but it deviates when we're sufficiently far away, allowing us to quantify when the harmonic approximation is valid. In practice, there is a very large number of physical systems which can be described accurately while only keeping the quadratic term. And this is why what we're doing here is so important. Whatever arbitrary potential we have, and however complex it is, if our particle is close enough to a local minimum, then its motion can be approximated by a simple potential just like this one. That depends quadratically on the displacement from the minimum. This particular potential is slightly different to the canonical harmonic potential that we were discussing earlier, because there is this constant term here and this position offset here. This is really just a detail. We can shift the origin of both axes to turn this expression into the canonical form. By adding a constant minus vx0, we get rid of the constant term, and by shifting the origin of the x-axis to x0, we also remove the offset. Right, so the final step is to identify this object here, which is a constant because it is a derivative evaluated at the origin, with the constant k we had earlier. We've just seen how harmonic potentials can be used to approximate the motion of a particle near an arbitrary minimum of a general one-dimensional potential. The same is true for higher dimensional potentials. Now imagine that we have a potential that depends on n variables. Then we can always expand that potential about a minimum and the lowest order term will be the quadratic term. Here I'm already assuming that I have a coordinate system in which the energy at the minimum is zero, and the minimum is located at the origin. But if this wasn't the case, we can always make a simple transformation to make it so. Again, close enough to the minimum, we can discard all higher order terms, and we're left with a quadratic term only. This quadratic term looks somewhat more complicated than the one for a one-dimensional system because there are cross terms which involve the derivatives with respect to two different coordinates here and here. However, it turns out that for Hamiltonians with quadratic potentials, it is always possible to make a change of coordinates from the original x to a new set u. And in this new set of coordinates, the potential becomes decoupled like this. As a result, the total Hamiltonian can be described as n individual one-dimensional harmonic oscillators. Therefore, if we work in terms of few coordinates, the problem reduces again to the simple 1D problem that we had earlier, with the small caveat that we have to solve a total of n 1D problems rather than just one. These new coordinates u are a concept that appears in many branches of physics and are called normal modes. Using this approach, many interesting systems can be described by simply knowing how to solve the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. A prominent example of this is the description of how atoms vibrate in solids. In the quantum theory, this is encoded by phonons, which contain information about a plethora of quantities such as the speed of sound or the heat capacity, and contribute to multiple phenomena such as heat transport or superconductivity. Another well-known example of the application of harmonic oscillators is in the description of the electromagnetic field. As we'll see, quantizing the harmonic oscillator is relatively straightforward, so describing systems such as these in terms of harmonic oscillators provides a really powerful platform on which to study them using quantum mechanics. So now that I have hopefully convinced you of the relevance of the harmonic oscillator, all we have left to do is to discuss it in the context of quantum mechanics. The total energy of a harmonic oscillator is given by the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy that we've been discussing. To move to quantum mechanics, all we have to do is to promote the position and momentum to the corresponding operators. This means that we can write down the Hamiltonian of a quantum harmonic oscillator like this. 
What we'll do in this series of videos on the quantum harmonic oscillator is to study the properties of this Hamiltonian. I really cannot emphasize enough the importance of the quantum harmonic oscillator. It is one of only a handful of quantum systems that can be solved exactly. This makes it a really useful system to exemplify all the key concepts when learning about quantum mechanics. But the fact that it is one of the few potentials that we know how to solve analytically also means that it is used to explain the physics of a lot of very important systems. In other words, everything that we learn from this Hamiltonian will be immediately useful to understand phenomena as diverse as atomic vibrations in solids or light. The quantum harmonic oscillator is a problem that you will encounter time and again in your study of physics. We have many other videos that look into different aspects of the quantum harmonic oscillator, so I wanted to encourage you to check them out because it'll give you a really comprehensive overview of what this type of problem is all about. And as always, if you liked the video, please subscribe.